This reading of Christ has the keys of hell and death by Charles Haddon Spurgeon is from the Free Grace Broadcaster magazine and is produced by Stillwater's Revival Books. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lived and was dead. And, behold, I am alive for evermore, and have the keys of hell and death. Revelation 1.18 Death is a land of darkness, as darkness itself, without any order. Yet a sovereign eye surveyed it, and a master hand holded its key. Hell is also a horrible region, but hell trembles at the presence of the Lord. Let us rejoice that nothing in heaven, earth, or in places under the earth is left to itself to engender anarchy. Everywhere, serene above the floods, the Lord set it king for ever and ever. No province of the universe is free from the divine rule. Things do not come by chance. Nowhere the chance and chaos reign. Nowhere is evil really and permanently enthroned. Rest assured that the Lord had prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rule it over all. For if the lowest hell and debt own his government, much more all things that are on this lower world. It is delightful for us to observe as we read this chapter that the government of hell and of debt is vested in the person of the man Christ Jesus. He who holdeth the keys of these dreadful regions is described by John as one like unto the Son of Man, Revelation 1.13, and we know that he was our Lord Jesus Christ himself. These keys are committed to the Son of Man, and Jesus Christ, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, made in all points like unto his brethren, rule it over all. The metaphor of keys is intended, no doubt, to set forth the double thought of our Lord's possessing both the rightful and the actual dominion over debt and hell. Christ had the keys of hell and debt. That is to say, he is rightfully the Lord over those dark regions, and rules them by indefeasible, that is, not able to be lost or overturned, title of sovereignty. He actually rules and manages in all the issues of the grave, and overrules all the councils of hell, restraining the mischievous devices of Satan, or turning them to subserve, that is, to be useful, his own designs of good. Our Lord Jesus Christ still is supreme. His kingdom, willingly or unwillingly, extends over all existences in whatever regions they may be. What is intended by the power of these keys here mentioned? First of all, a key is used for opening. Hence, our Lord can open the gates of debt and hell. It is His to open the gate of the separated spirits, to admit his saints one by one to their eternal felicity, that is, happiness. When the time shall come for us to depart out of this world unto the Father, no hand but that of the well-beloved shall put that golden key into the lock and open the pearly gate that admits the righteous to the spirit land. He is the resurrection and the life. Because he lives, we shall live also. At his bidding, every bolt of death's prison house shall be drawn, and the huge iron gates of the sepulchre shall be rolled back. Of all that the Father gave to Christ, he will lose nothing, but will surely raise it up at the last day. John 6.39 
Christ has purchased the bodies as well as the souls of his people. He hath redeemed them by his blood. And their mortal frames are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Rest assured, he will not lose a part of his purchase. It is not the will of our Father in heaven that the Redeemer should be defrauded of any part of his purchased possession. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Isaiah 26.19 But a key is also used to shut the door. Even so, Jesus will both shut in and shut out. His golden key will shut in his people in heaven. But, alas, there is the dark side to this shutting of the gate. It is Christ who with his key shall shut the gates of heaven against unbelievers. A key is used to shut and to open. So it is used to shut in, in reference to hell, those spirits who are immured, that is, imprisoned there. Between us and you, said Abraham to Dives, that is, the rich man at whose gate Lazarus lay, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that they would come from thence. Luke 16.26 It is Christ's key that had shut in the lost spirits, so that they cannot roam by way of respite, nor escape by way of pardon. We understand by Christ having the keys of hell that he rules over all that are in hell. Hence, he rules over the damned spirits. In this life, they would not have this man to rule over them. But in the life to come, they must submit whether they will or not. In that seeding cauldron, every wave of fire is guided by the will of the man Christ, and the mark of his sovereignty is on every iron chain. This the ungodly will be compelled to feel with terror, for though the ferocity of their natures will remain, the boastfulness of their pride shall be taken from them. Though they would still revolt, they shall find themselves hopelessly fettered and powerless to accomplish their designs. He who came to save was rejected by them. Now he only reveals himself to them as one mighty to destroy. What must be the consternation of those that were loudest against Christ on earth, the men who denied his deity, the infidels who vented curses upon his blessed name? Your Voltaire, an anti-Christian playwright and author, and Thomas Paine, a critic of the Bible, who were never satisfied except when they uttered bitter words against the man of Nazareth. What will be their amazement? What consternation and confusion shall overwhelm that man who said he lived in the twilight of Christianity? to find himself where the blaze of Christ's glory shall forever be as a furnace to his guilty soul. Oh, that none of us may know what it is to be ruled in justice by Christ because we would not be ruled by mercy. As in hell, Christ has power over all the damned spirits. So our text implies that he has power over all the devils. An abject slave of Christ art thou, O Satan, a very scullion, that is, a mere unskilled kitchen servant, in the kitchen of providence. When thou thinkest most to effect thine own purposes, and to overthrow the kingdom of Christ on earth, even then what art thou but a mere hack, accomplishing still the purposes of thy master, whom in vain thou dost blaspheme. Lo, at Christ's girdle are the keys of hell, 
Let the whole legion of accursed spirits tremble. Joyous is the thought that Jesus rules over all the redeemed spirits in heaven, for we hope to be there soon. This shall be among our dearest joys. Without temptation, without infirmity, without weariness, we shall serve our Lord day and night in his temple. My brethren, of all the joys of heaven, next to that of being with Christ, one delights to think of serving Christ. Ah, how rapturous will be our song! How zealously will we praise him! How earnest shall be our service! If he should give us commissions to distant worlds, as perhaps he will, if he shall prepare us to become preachers of his truth to creatures in unknown orbs, that is, heavenly bodies, if he shall call us through revolving ages to publish to newly created myriads, that is, countless numbers of men, the wondrous grace of God in Christ, with what ardent pleasure will we accept the service? How constantly, how heartily, will we tell out the story of our salvation by the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, that we could serve him here as we wish, but we shall serve him there without fault or flaw. Oh, happy heaven, because Jesus had the key of it and reigned supreme, when shall we stand upon thy sea of glass before his throne? One more remark is wanted to complete the explanation of the power of the keys. Our Lord is said to have the keys of debt, from which we gather that all the issues of debt are at his disposal alone. No man can die unless Jesus opens the mystic door of debt. Even the ungodly man owes his spared life to Christ. It is the intercession and the interposition of Jesus that keeps breath even in the swearer's nostrils. Long since hast thou been consumed in the fire of God's wrath, O sinner, had not Jesus used his authority to keep thee out of the jaws of debt. As for his saints, their consolation is that their debt is entirely in his hands. In the midst of fever and pestilence, we shall never die until he wills it. In the times of the greatest healthiness, when all the air is balm, we shall not live a second longer than Jesus has purposed. The place, the circumstance, the exact second of our departure, have all been appointed by him and settled long ago, in love and wisdom. A thousand angels could not hurl us to the grave, nor could a host of cherubim confine us there one moment after Jesus said, Arise. This is our comfort. Let us never fear death then, but rather rejoice at the approach of it, since it comes at our dear bridegroom's bidding. Though the prospect of our Lord's coming is sweet, immeasurably sweet, yet the prospect of going to him meanwhile, if he so wills it, is not without its sweetness too. Christ had the key of debt, and therefore debt to us is no longer a gate of terror. What is the key of this power? Whence did Christ obtain this right? to have the keys of hell and debt? That he not derive it first of all from his Godhead? In the 18th verse he said, I am he that liveth, language that only God can use. God said, There is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Isaiah 45.6 and Jesus, being God, claimeth the same self-existence. I am he that liveth. Now since Christ is God, he certainly had power over heaven, earth, and hell. 
He is the creator of all things. He is the preserver of all things. All power belongeth unto him. As for all things that are apart from him, they would vanish as a puff of air is gone, if he willed it so. He alone existed. He alone is. Therefore let him wear the crown. Let him have undivided rule. That doctrine of the deity of Christ, how I tremble for those who will not receive it. Brethren, if there be anything in the word of God that is clear and plain, it is surely this. If there be any doctrine that is necessary for our salvation, it is this. How could we trust to a mere man? If there be anything that can give us comfort when we come to rest upon Christ, it is just this. We are not looking to an angel, nor depending upon a creature, but are resting upon him who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty God. Having such a rock of our salvation as the ever-living and ever-blessed God, let the thought kindle in our souls the purest joy. But the key to this power lies also in our Saviour's conquests. He hath the keys of debt and hell, because he had actually conquered both these powers. You know how he met hell in the dreadful onset in the garden, how all the powers of darkness there combined against him. Such was the agony of that struggle, that he sweat great drops of blood falling to the ground. Yet he sustained the brunt of that onset without wavering, and kept the field unbeaten. He continued to wrestle with those evil powers upon the cross. In that thick midday midnight, into which no curious eyes could pry, in the midst of that darkness, he continued to fight, his heel bruised, but breaking the dragon's head meanwhile. Grim was the conquest, but glorious was the victory, worthy to be sung by angels in eternal chorus. Take down your sweetest harps, ye seraphs. Lift up your loudest notes, ye cherubim, unto him that fought the dragon and overcame him. Unto Christ be glory for ever and ever. Well, that Jesus deserved to rule the provinces that he had subdued in fight. He has conquered the king of hell and destroyed the works of the devil. Good right had he to be king over the domain of the vanquished. As to debt, ye know how our Lord vanquished him. By debt he conquered that. When the hands were nailed, they became potent to fight with the grave. When the feet were fastened to the wood, then began they to trample on the sepulchre. When the dead pangs began to thrill through every nerve of the Redeemer's body, then his arrow shot through the loins of death. And when his anguished soul was ready to take its speedy flight and leave his blessed corpse, then did the tyrant sustain a mortal wound. Our Lord's entrance into the tomb was the taking possession of his enemy's stronghold. His sleep within the sepulchre's stony walls was the transformation of the prison into a couch of rest. But especially in the resurrection, when, because he could not be held by the bonds of debt, neither could his soul be kept in Hades, he rose again in glory, then did he become the debt of debt and hell's destruction. As if to prove that he had the keys of the grave, Jesus passed in and out again, and he had made free passage now for his people. By his achievements, by his doings, he had won for himself the power of the keys. 
we have one more truth to remember. Jesus Christ is installed in this high place of power and dignity by the Father himself as a reward for what he has done. He was himself to divide the spoil with the strong, but the Father had promised to give to him a portion with the great. Isaiah 53.12 See the reward for the shame that he endured among the sons of men. He stooped lower than the lowest. He has risen higher than the highest. He wore the crown of thorns, but now he wears the triple crown of heaven, earth, and hell. He was the servant of servants, but now he is the king of kings and lord of lords. Earth would not find him shelter. A stable must be the place of his birth, and a borrowed tomb the sepulchre of his dead body. But now... All space is his, time and eternity tremble at his bidding, and there is no creature, however minute or vast, that is not subject to him. How greatly hath the Father glorified him whom men rejected and despised! Let us adore him, let our hearts, while we think over these plain but precious truths, come and spread their riches at his feet, and crown him Lord of all. Should not this contemplation make us say, Let us worship him who had the keys of hell and debt. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with songs. Preaching is not the great end of the Sabbath day. Listening to sermons is not the great aim of Sundays. It is a means. What is the end? Why, the end, as far as we can attain it on earth, is for us to glorify God in service, and especially in the singing of his praises. Worship rendered to God in prayer and praise is the true fruit of the Sabbath, and I am afraid we are behind in this. I wish that when believers come together, they would oftener render unto Christ the coronals, that is, relating to a crown or coronet, of their hymns to crown him Lord of all. His enemies miss no opportunity to spite him. Those that hate his gospel are zealous to bring shame upon it. Oh, miss no opportunities to extol him with your praises, and to honour him with the holiness of your lives and the zeal of your service. Is he king over heaven, debt, and hell? Then shall he be king over the triple territory of my spirit, soul, and body and I will make all my powers and passions yield praise to him. To conclude, if to the righteous the lesson from all this is, fear not, methinks the lesson to the ungodly is, fear and tremble, Christ hath the keys of debt. You may die this moment, you may die ere you reach your homes, you have not the key of debt. You cannot therefore prolong your life. But Christ had it, and he can end the times of his long suffering just when he so wills it. And what would it be to some of you if the gate of debt was opened for you and you were driven through it like dumb, driven cattle this very day? O oh man, what would become of thee? O oh woman, what would become of thee, if now those eyes should glaze and that pulse should stop? I beseech thee, consider thy ways, and turn thee unto God, lest thou die and perish suddenly. Remember, soul, if thou wouldest fight it out with Christ and be his enemy, yet thou canst not, for he is Lord and will be Lord. 
Even shouldest thou fly to hell to escape him, he ruleth there. Wherever you may go, there shall the remembrances of his rejected love pierce you like barbed arrows. Even in hell shall the glory of his power, which you could not trust down, though you tried to do it, strike you with deeper despair. I implore you to listen to his gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16.16 16. This is the message he gave us when he was taken up. Then yield to his gospel. Believe, that is, trust implicitly in him who died on the cross of Calvary to make atonement, and now live it to make it intercession. Trust in him, be baptized in his name, confessing your sins and acknowledging yourself to be his disciple. This is the gospel, reject it at your peril. Submit to it, I beseech you, for Christ's sake. Contemporary words have periodically been added, after older words, to aid in understanding. These words originally appeared as footnotes inserted by the Free Grace Broadcaster. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan Hard Drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.